I'm still speaking about uh, the uh, the whole concept, uh, uh, principle, law of sowing and reaping. In fact, uh, as I was preparing for this morning's message, I had a plan to go somewhere, and as I sometimes do, sometimes I know where I'm going at the front end of preparation time, and sometimes I don't, but I was pretty sure where I was going to go, but things took a turn halfway halfway through it, and not, not a turn for worse, but they took a turn, and so I was somewhat tempted to move my little lectern behind the shield over there, uh, where the drummer normally sits, maybe for some protection. So if people start throwing rotten eggs or, or ripe tomatoes or worse, start throwing rocks, it'll not affect me. But then I thought, no, people love me and I love people and this is a church of love and, uh, and we're all mature people, we can handle things. So if things get a little bit stronger along the way, and because I was talking to God, I said, Lord, I, oh, that's going to result in some ouch. Some, there's going to be some ouches, and I'd rather hear hallelujahs than ouches. But uh, anyway, let's just work our way through this thing. Let's see how we go this morning. And uh, just thought I'd put a little disclaimer out this morning and uh, prepare you all. No need to put on the helmets. Uh, I'm not throwing anything at you. Um, and... Uh, but do wear the armor of God. That's always helpful. <laughs> Knowing that you put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, there's never any condemnation. But have you know that the word of God not only encourages us and teaches us, but the word of God also corrects us and sometimes rebukes us. And, uh, and I'm not planning to rebuke you today, but if the word rebukes you today, just smile and let everybody know that everything is all good. Let everybody know that you're mature and you can handle it and, uh, and everything's going to be absolutely fine. <laughs> All right, let's pray and commit our time to the Lord. Father, this morning we want to thank you, Lord, again for your word. And Lord Jesus, you said that your words are spirit and they are life. And at this time we submit ourselves to the preaching of your word, submit ourselves to your presence in the house, submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You're the head of the church, Lord, Lord Jesus, and you have a plan, you have a purpose. And Lord, uh, you have a specific uh, uh, process in mind in building the church. And we thank you, Lord God, that the gates of hell do not prevail against us, that we are the church glorious, we are the church triumphant. And we thank you, Lord God, that you have prepared a place for us, Lord, uh, that you brought us to our wealthy place. And Lord, there is a particular procedure in order to get there. And I thank you, Father, that you're teaching us today, that you're instructing us once again. I thank you, Lord God, that heavens are opened over this place and that we are enjoying the goodness of God in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Um, everybody's got an outline. Um, today is uh, the third time that we are teaching on the choice of sowing and the joy of reaping. And I guess the title is very specific in the sense that we have, we have a choice. We can choose uh, because God's given us dominion and we can choose to learn things and operate accordingly and then we will have the joy of reaping. And we took the uh, uh, scripture passage out of Galatians chapter 6 is our theme uh, scripture, if you like, as Brother Hagen used to say, is our golden text. Uh, and uh, I want to read that again out of the J.B. Phillips translation. It says, don't be under any, under any illusion. Uh, you cannot make a fool of God. A man's harvest in life will depend entirely on what he sows. If he sows to his own lower nature, his harvest will be the decay and death of his own nature. But if he sows to the, for the Spirit, he will reap uh, the harvest of everlasting life by the Spirit. Let us not grow tired in doing good, for unless we throw in our hand, the ultimate harvest is assured. Let us then do good to all. His opportunity um, offers, especially to those who belong to the Christian household. Uh, just going to make a few repeats of what we've already said, and then we'll start to cover some new ground. But effectively, we, we have said that uh, that our life today is the result of the seeds we've sown yesterday, or should I say the quality of our life today is determined by the seeds we've sown yesterday. Uh, sowing and reaping is a fundamental principle in God's kingdom, and it works for everybody all the time. Um, it's like the law of gravity. Nobody starts floating around. All of a sudden, the law of gravity always holds us down. If we jump off somebody, we will always, rather than flip up, we will always flip down. Uh, so the law of gravity works all the time, and so does the law of sowing and reaping. It works for us all the time for good or for bad. Um, and this morning, I would like to speak to you specifically about sowing seeds uh, of a financial uh, a kind. Uh, of course, everything we do is a seed. We've already been there, we've already discussed it. My attitude is a seed. Uh, my words that I speak are seeds. Um, every kind deed is a seed. Um, 
In fact, uh, my faith is a seed that I sow with the words that I speak. And if I just speak my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking faith because my mind's all over the place. Uh, and so we need to be very purposeful with the words that we speak because words are seeds. Um, in fact, Proverbs tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So don't speak your mind. It'll get you into trouble. Be very purposeful about what comes out of your mouth. And certain things ought not to come out of our mouth. Though we may think them, don't let them come out of your mouth. Because as soon as they come out of your mouth, it's a seed sown. Um, and if it's not a seed of life, it'll be a seed of death. Uh, now this morning, I wanted to major on, uh, on financial seeds that we sow. In fact, Vanessa and I have discussed this extensively. That's something that we operate in all the time. Uh, in fact, uh, we kind of determined that uh, you could virtually come to, to my house and point to every item in terms of furniture and everything there is, a lot of the clothing that we wear, uh, practically everything that we have is a result of a seed we have sown, and specifically a financial seed. We came in, Vanessa and I came into our first home by having sown a sizable financial seed towards uh, the harvest of a house. Um, and uh, that's something that we operate in all the time. Um, I should say that we live, you know, people talk about a certain standard of living, a certain lifestyle. A lot of people live beyond their means. Um, and we ought not to do that, but we should be able to live beyond or above the level of our income because our income is not our source. God is our source. Praise God if somebody's got a good income, but God is not limited to that. Uh, and Vanessa and I have always lived above our income uh, in terms of lifestyle because we have not limited ourselves to income um, in terms of you know the, the wages or the salary and so forth. That's not to say that we haven't worked hard. We've worked very hard at times, but it's been by the grace of God that God's brought us into that understanding of the principle of sowing and reaping. As I say, you could go around, what about this, what about that? Uh, a lot of stuff uh, that we have is, is, is uh, the result of seeds we have sown. We've been very purposeful. In fact, my wife particularly so. Uh, some of you might remember teaching that she brought some years ago now, and she just dug up uh, our file of where we record uh, offerings that we have given, because every offering is a seed. Uh, and it's important to remember seeds that we have sown if we want to be purposeful about it. So Vanessa has written up a sheet of A4 with th different boxes in there, and uh, we wrote down the need that we had, and we wrote down the seed that we sold and the date, and then we wrote down the harvest when it came in. Uh, now, that might not be everybody's sort of idea of fun. Uh, some people just don't want to write anything down, but uh, Vanessa is very good at writing things down. And she brought that thing out and said, oh, oh, absolutely, I remember that. And I remember this and how God came through on this and God came through on that. So we've got a few things up on our walls, even right now, of seeds that we have sown, both both uh, ourselves personally and also seeds that we have sown as a, as a local church and we're having a certain... A certain uh, trusting God in regards to certain results and certain uh, certain um, you know aspects, even in regards to our facility here, we've sown seeds, and and it's been said before, what works for an individual will work for a local church, um, and it'll work for a business, it'll work for an organisation as well. Um, so this morning I would like to speak to you about financial seeds, uh, and part way through it, this is uh, things have taken a bit of a turn, uh, but really God God has a uh, um, a concern that the, the people of God are actually prospering and that their seed is sown in the right kind of a way and that there is a right kind of expectation from the right kind of uh, uh, source. So let me start reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading out of the NIV translation, specifically the 84, that's the 1984 translation. Uh, Paul speaking, he says, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift that you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as a grudging giving, as, a, as one grudgingly given. Verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows uh, generously will also reap generously. Each man uh, should give as he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that in all things, uh, at all times, having all that you need, 
you will abound in every good work. Verse 9, as it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your, your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, that's quite a mouthful. There's a lot in there. And I don't know about you. I read over there and say, what was that? So then I go back to it and I break it all down into bite-sized pieces and then I can handle it much better. Um, so I just want to talk to you about uh, the whole aspect of uh, sowing financial seed. Uh, Paul the Apostle, uh, right here, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to the Corinthian church. In fact, I've written down some one-liners uh, underneath that. And the subject here is a financial offering from the Corinthian church to the Jerusalem church. Um, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that there was a certain prophet by the name of Agabus, and he went up to Antioch, and the Bible says that he began to prophesy, prophesy about a famine that was going to come. Um, and it, in, in fact, it took place under the, under the, in, during the days of uh, Claudius Caesar, uh, Caesar Claudius, who was uh, leading Rome at that time. Um, somehow, the Jerusalem church was hit harder than a lot of other places. And the believers down there, specifically the church, was really struggling. Uh, have you remember, we've just read out of Galatians that we ought not to grow weary in doing well, and then especially that we ought to focus on the household of faith, that if we're giving anywhere, we ought to major on the, on the brothers and sisters, major on believers rather than scattering our seeds in any old direction. And that's what was going on there. The Corinthian church had promised, had made a pledge, saying to Paul, yes, we will give an offering, and yes, it's going to be a generous one, and then yes, we will be happy for that offering to, ship down, to be shipped down to Jerusalem to help the saints down there that are struggling right now, uh, and, uh, and, but they didn't do anything about it. So Paul is now writing them a letter. This is now 2 Corinthians. They talked about it in 1 Corinthians. And now Paul is saying, come on guys, now it's now time to, to, for the doing of it. You promised, and I have been bragging about you guys and your willingness to give to the churches in Macedonia, over to the Philippians and to various other ones. I've been bragging about you guys. But he says, when, when I come, I don't want to be embarrassed. And he says, I don't want you to be embarrassed because so far all you've done is promised. You've made a pledge, but you haven't made good your pledge. So that's the subject of the, of the scripture passage here. And the request is send money, give an offering. That was the request. And the principle that Paul's speaking about is the principle of sowing and reaping. And you know, Paul, who practically rolled to two-thirds of the New Testament, was big on sowing and reaping. He called it sowing and reaping here. Over in Philippians, he called it giving and receiving. Uh, the Bible also referred to it as, as seed time and harvest. It's never just says sowing and sowing. It's always sowing and reaping. It never says just giving and giving. It says giving and receiving. Um, and uh, and uh, so it's important that, uh, that giving and receiving is always hooked together. Sowing and reaping is always hooked together. Many Christians just chuck a seat down somewhere and walk away and give no, no thought to it anymore, have no intentions on reaping. But God wants us to reap. God wants us to, to, to get a return for our giving. And, uh, and don't be spiritual and say, oh, I don't want that. I just want to give. I don't want to get anything back. That's unscriptural. So don't say that. Oh, we don't want to be rich. We just, you know, we just want to have enough for, for me, my wife, and our two kids, you know, us four and no more. Don't be selfish. If you need a mate, look outside of yourself. Okay? You know that some, sometimes these sayings, they sound really good and, and spiritual, but you hold them against the light of God's word and suddenly we realize that we're actually in the flesh. It's just a soulish statement. There's nothing, nothing spiritual about it. Do I need to move myself behind the protective cup over there? We're doing okay? And uh, so that's the principle, sowing and reaping. And he, he gives us an illustration. He says, uh, he says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And some translations actually talk about that Paul was using the agricultural principle that's employed in, in a farming type environment. In fact, one translation actually says, he says, remember this. He says, or oh, the point that I'm making is this. The farmer who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And, uh, and he, the farmer who sows generously will also reap sparingly. Every farmer knows that. And Paul says, remember, he says, this is the point that I'm making. As you guys approach the offering giving now, be thinking about agricultural principles because the same is true in the realm of the Spirit. 
It says, you sow a financial seed, and it says, depending on the size of your seed, it says, you're going to have a certain size harvest. Uh, and then, so it's the principle, the request, there is the, the practice of it, and, 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 uh, and then the practice is, you do it now. He says, <laughs> you talked about it for a whole year, do it now. All right? Uh, have you know that it is the doers of the word that are blessed, not the hearers only? Many people get excited when they hear, but it's not until we do that this begins to work for us. Because faith speaks and faith acts. If faith doesn't speak and faith doesn't act, it isn't really faith. Uh, or it's a kind of dead faith. And faith is made alive when we act on these principles and suddenly the Word of God begins to work for us. We might look and say, how will I ever get this working in my life? By speaking it and by acting on it. And suddenly things begin to work. Um, so the practice and in the seed. The seed is the money. Paul says, you guys, he says, your money that you're giving is seed. The seed is money. Now the seed is not always money. But in this instance here, the seed is money. Other times the seed is the word of God that we sow into our heart. And then the seed is the words that we speak. That's a seed also. And my attitude is a seed. Uh, everything that I do is a seed. But in this instance, the seed is the money. And it also speaks about the ground. The ground is your local church. Paul says to the believers, says, I don't want there to be any flurry of activity when I get there. He says, I want you guys to gather the offering together and bring it into the local church and have it ready. Um, and so that's the ground. Every, every seed needs to be sown in a ground. It can't just be floated around somewhere and be expecting it to come off or to start germinating. It, it needs to have ground. And he says, your local church is the ground for that seed. And then the result will be, he says, that God will multiply your seed uh, and give you a harvest. In fact, specifically, one translation says that God will multiply your seed sown. And this is the beauty of it. Uh, this is the beauty of it. We might say, well, you know, there's an offering being received. I can't afford to give. I can do without that money. Uh, and then we give the money. But God says, well, that's wonderful. But actually, you, you, might, you, you will have to do without the money for now. Uh, because as you give that seed, quite obviously, if, say if you had $100 in your pocket and there's an offering and you give 50 of it, quite obviously, you've got to do without that $50 for now. But God says it's not going to be like that forever. God says while that seed is being sown in the ground, I'm going to multiply this thing and at some point in the future, uh, I'm going to bring that seed back to you by way of a harvest, not just the same amount that you've given, but I'm going to multiply it. And this is, that's really the beauty. See, any businessman knows if he makes an investment in something, he doesn't just want the same amount of money back, otherwise what's the point? Now that's in business. Now as far as Christian love and giving, offering is concerned, it's good to give and, and so forth and not saying, well, what's the point? It, it's just the right thing to do. But God says, because you do the right thing, God says, I'm going to multiply your seed. And uh, in fact, the Bible, all the way through the, through the, the, the Gospels, and Jesus was speaking, he talks about the kingdom of God and, and he talks about uh, that a seed is sown and then it brings forth, it germinates, it brings forth first the blade, then the ear and then the grain in the ear. Uh, I grew up on a farm and I knew that when my father sold one single seed, he never did, he always scattered. But each single seed grew up into a plant and then when you got, say, uh, say grain like rye or wheat, uh, you got rolls of seeds all the way up. And for all I know, I've never sat down and counted them. I will next time, uh, just for the interest of it. But for one seed, there could be 30, 40, 60, 80, 80 seeds in, in, that one, in that one plant. You take corn, uh, maize, uh, one maize kernel gives you, uh, must surely be over 100 kernels on corn on cob. Okay, now I know many of you haven't grown up on a farm and a lot of there's for them a corn on cob that you pull out the freezer. Well, that's come from a farm. And a farmer, okay, that's come from the farm. And a farmer has actually literally gone and put one seed into the ground to produce that one corn. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole plant and there's various cobs off of one plant. So imagine the multiplication of that. Now, God multiplies our seed sown to a certain extent based on the faith, on the level of faith that we're operating. That's why I want to increase my faith. I want there to be a greater return next year for my giving than what there is this year for my giving. All right? Everybody okay that we're talking about money this morning? And nobody nervous? Don't get nervous on me now. So we'll talk about money in the church. Well, you, you, you read the gospel and see how much Jesus talked about money in the church. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. So that's the point. God will multiply your seed and give you harvest. And then the harvest, what's the harvest? The harvest is more money. Everybody say more money. Let's say it with more like uh, 
more money. Let, come on, more money. Let's say it like, like the Italians would say, the money, the money. Come on, say it. The money, the money. Hey, hey, my brother-in-law is Italian. Hey, Stefano, he says, we go into business together and we make a lot of money, he says. <laughs> <laughs> He's a wonderful man, just love the man. <laughs> so the money, that's what we're talking about here today, the money. And uh, <laughs> over the page, a series of statements. Uh, I thought I'd write them down and then I am able to comment from it. Uh, so I won't deviate and get sidetracked into uh, other things. Every dollar sown in God's kingdom has the potential for a harvest. The potential. Not everybody gets a harvest because people don't always know things that they should know. People are not do, doing, not doing things right. This is not about blame. This is not about things. But people just operate out of ignorance rather than out of being instructed. Um, and many times people are instructed wrong. So I thought it's good that we just, you know, get to this thing so we can all get a harvest for the seed that we've sown and get some money back. All right. <laughs> Small offerings will result in big, uh, let me start again. Small offerings will result in small harvests and big offerings will result in big harvests. That's what Paul said. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. That's the principle. So in other words, you can't get a big harvest from a small offering. Uh, the farmer knows if he chucks out one sack of seeds, then he will get several sacks back, but he won't get uh, hundreds and thousands of sacks back. Uh, he knows that. Uh, this is when my father was doing the farming there and when the grain was ready and we had to go out there and buy, mostly by hand. Uh, uh, I mean, the stuff was cut by, by a mowing machine, but then it was gathered up by hand and, uh, and bundled together and so forth. And then we had to bring it into the barn and everything. And then, and then the threshing was taking place. So that was done by a machine. And I was responsible for making sure that all the straw and everything was being fed in the right direction. We had some machinery for that. And uh, then at the other end, uh, the grain came out and there was a man uh, that used to help us from the neighbors. He was a farmer also. And he would get these sacks, throw them over his shoulder and carry them down into the mill where then the flour was milled uh, and so forth. So uh, the sacks of money that came out at the other end of the threshing machine was always uh, determined by the sacks that my father had carried out into the field at the beginning of the, of, of this, of the growing season. Um, and so God wants to use our offerings to bring us to greater levels of prosperity. And that's why offering time is exciting time. Because God wants to use the offering time to bring us into greater levels of prosperity. When people say, oh, near the offering, and people you know, begin to clutch their, 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 their money and, and, and everything. Oh, no, it's offering time. No, no, just let's get excited. This is uh, good news, okay? God wants to use that offering uh, to bring, bring you into greater levels of prosperity. Uh, I told you before that sometimes... Uh, um, and, you know, sometimes I guess while we're here, I, I'm sometimes up here, my wife's already bring, brings out the, the, the pen and writes checks out and look across, and she gives scary amounts, that girl, I'll tell you that. Like, uh, she, you know, she's got a big vision, but she knows that in order to get big, big uh, harvest, you've got to give a big offering. In fact, sometimes I was outright scared uh, when I look across and look at the numbers that she's written down. But I've learned over the years that rather than just slowing her down in her giving, we're going to step it up. All right, because we have got a big vision. We want to go somewhere. There's a certain personal vision that we have, certain things that we want to have and enjoy, and uh, and we want to be able to participate in giving in other places. We want to be able to give more in the future. So the way to get there, uh, partially, because uh, it's not the full story, but partially is we need to give bigger offerings. Um, and so God has a greater desire to prosper his children than what most of his children have in wanting to prosper. Let me say that again. I wrestled with that. I want to make sure I wanted to get the wording right. That God has a greater desire to prosper his children than what most of his children have in wanting to prosper. And you get that. People say, oh, you know, we don't want to be rich. We don't want to be, well, forget rich. Just say, say, say I, want to, I want to prosper. If the word says I need to prosper, then I want to prosper. Let's not fight against the word. Let's not fight against God's plan. In fact, if you go back over the page and look in the latter part of that Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, down in verse 11, it says, and you will be made rich in every way. Okay, 2 Corinthians 9, uh, later part of that passage there in verse 11, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. So in other words, God wants to use offerings 
to bring you and I into greater levels of prosperity so that we can participate in more offerings and participate at a higher level. Because how many of you know that there's needs in the kingdom of God? There's huge needs in the kingdom of God. To harvest all the souls that need to be harvested, it requires some dollars. It requires some money. For the kingdom of God to be extended, for you know, to, for the gospel to be sent out and everything, that, uh, that praise God for a lot of these things are done voluntary and it's absolutely wonderful. But if we had more money to throw at this thing, any businessman knows that if he wants to... to do more promotion and, uh, you know, his whole advertising budget. If he wants to do more promotion, he needs to spend more money in that area. And in the kingdom of God, it's not entirely different. Uh, if we have more money to send out missionaries, we have more money to send out gospel workers, more money to give away, you know, just however we, whatever means we use to, to uh, spread the gospel, then we, we, we can do better. So God's got a bigger desire to prosper his children than what most of his children have in wanting to prosper. And lastly, when we look to God, to supply our need, he's looking to us to give him a seed. Let me say that again. When we look to God to supply our needs, he's looking to us to give him a seed. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. They pray, God, give me this. God, I, have, I need that. And so it gets, okay, God says, give me a seed to work with. Put something into the ground so that I can bless something. Because the principle is sowing and reaping. The principle is seed time and harvest. The principle is, is planting and harvesting. That's the principle. Now let me bring up a, an example from uh, 1 Kings, from the Old Testament. It's just one example of many that we could go to. Um, and the heading here is, sow a seed towards your need. What is your need today? Uh, sometimes uh, we've said, name, name your seed. Say, this seed here, I told uh, the Bible school um, students on Tuesday night that I just bought a, uh, a, a, a television set because we had a small group at our house and uh, 14 old people turning up and I thought, well, it's going to look funny if we sit in that large lounge of ours and look into a dinky little 29-inch TV, so I want to get a decent TV. And we had already sown a seed and said, oh, right, this is it. Let's pull the trigger on it now. I've already researched it and gone over it again. In fact, I was just talking to somebody. They met me in one of the shops a couple of years ago, and I was looking back then already. And I thought, right, now is the time uh, to sow the seed. So, so we named our seed. We called it, this is the television seed. So when there was an offering at a certain time, we said, okay, let's give to what's an offering, but let's name our seed. This is the television um, seed. And then this here is the, the, the holiday seed, and this is the seed for for this, and so name your seed. Um, and that's why you can see that unless you write your stuff down, it's just going to get horribly confused. Um, unless you just got that many seeds out there all the time and just always calling in the harvest, uh, then uh, you know you can move on and forget about what, what you've done and not release your faith and keep it active all the time. Somebody said, aim your seed at your need. Aim your seed at your need. So what is your need right now? Um, um, whatever that is, uh, uh, you know, you want to buy a house, then put, put a, a sizable offering together and put that into the offering and say, all right, this is our house seed. We're trusting God for a, a house. Uh, Vanessa and I, when we were young, and we're still young today, absolutely, praise God, heaven ha hardly aged the day. Um, Bible says that we are renewed day by day. And uh, so when we were young, we had a little bit of money there um, for two bits of deposit for a house. Um, and... Um, and, and somehow we, we knew it wasn't going to be enough to, to, to get us a deposit, and we just said, right, uh, we need to step up by faith. We'd learned some of these principles, some of these truths, and we said, all right, let's, let's give this thing away as a seed. Let's give the whole thing away as a seed, which we did. We gave that seed, um, and then, of course, you know, so, oh, no, we've just given away the deposit for our house. Well, it wasn't the full deposit for our house. It wasn't even enough for the deposit, but it was part of the deposit for our house. We gave that away. Um, put it into gospel work, and some of them might say, oh, no, you young people, you're all crazy. You need to put your money together rather than give it away. But, you know, it was a period of, uh, of, uh, of, of a period later where God just helped us to get into a house, um, and that was without deposit. So it's amazing about suddenly God opening doors that previously not open. Um, and, of course, we had that house, and then we moved on from there and built another house, and we had sold a sizable seed for that house as well. As I said, it's something that we do something that we operate in. We're very purposeful about it, and uh, if we kind of neglect it, we pull each other up on it again and say, let's be purposeful about this thing, because the Bible says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Um, in fact, in some instances, it could be as much as, say, say for argument's sake, that uh, 
that they were a building fund offering for the church. And say, right, well, that's a good thing. That's a that's a house. That's a house offering for God's house. You know, for God, I don't mean you know we are God's house, but this is our facility. This is the club rooms. So we want to say another 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 building and say, well, that's a good opportunity because I need a house too. And here's an opportunity for me to sow my house seed, uh, a seed for for the ha- for the house in, into God's house. Um, and then to trust God that he will indeed multiply the seed you've sown and bring that harvest back into your life so that you get into, into a house of your own. Um, therefore, people don't understand and an offering is being received for, say, uh, brother so-and-so or minister so-and-so. People say, oh, he's much more prosperous than what I am. I'm not giving him any money. You completely miss the point. You, that's why Paul said, the point that I'm making is this. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sells bountifully will reap bountifully. You completely miss the point. You approach this thing from a soulish sort of a level, and, and, and reason will kick in, and the devil will teach you out of, uh, of, of your harvest every time if you can't sow a seed. Um, are we still doing all right today? So, um, there's this woman. In fact, let me read from 1 Kings 17. Uh, Verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him, this is to Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Seraphath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Seraphath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her, saying, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hands. So she said, As the Lord lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare for myself and for my son that we may eat it and die. Clearly, the situation was quite desperate. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you, do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me, and afterwards make some for yourself and for your son. You know, the cheek of it. Imagine, here's the preacher, hitting on a, on a, on a solo mother. I mean, the cheek of it. It's amazing. And, and, and then, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, verse 14, the bin of flour will not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. See, if we want to get into God's provision, you've got to rise above the level of the soul. Uh, you, you've got to get into the spirit of things uh, rather than in the flesh, rather than interpreting everything on a flesh level, uh, everything in the natural where reason reasons us in and out of certain situations and certain things and so forth. So basically, uh, it says here that uh, she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken by Elijah. Now, Jesus talked about that story. He says there were many riddles in Sidon uh, in those days, but to none was Elijah sent except to the widow of Seraphath. So in other words, she was not the only poor woman at that time. And, and, so, uh, and so what you and I need to understand is that God wants to help every poor person, whether woman or man, uh, child, young person. God wants to help everybody, whether you know they're, 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 they're a businessman that's struggling, whether it's a solo mother or whatever it is, but we need to get into the spirit rather than operate on a flesh level and interpret things from a flesh uh, kind of a, a scenario. So she had a need and God spoke to her about a seed. You notice that? God didn't just visit her and open the front door and shove in just a couple of truckloads of groceries. God visited her and said, you need to sow a seed. Um, And Elijah said to her in verse 13, do not fear. You see, when things are desperate, people tend to clasp clasp their their, their wallet, their their purse, you know, harder and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the position to give now. But he says, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. In other words, gather your sticks. It's not uncommon. You know, there's still people in developing countries today, uh, places where the women go out, they get a stick so they can make a fire and put together some sort of, uh, you know, bread. And uh, she had a bit of flour. She had a bit of oil. She was going to make her last bit of bread. They call it a cake here, but it's not a cake. It's a piece of bread, uh, flat pancake, if you like. Do as you have said. But, but, but when, it's, when it's made, he says, you bring me a cake first. Um, and, uh, and bring it to me and afterwards make some for yourself and for your son. 
Uh, in fact, he was even suggesting that the first lot that comes off the oven, he says, bring that to the man of God. Don't eat that yourself, because if you eat it yourself, you're going to be like every other widow. Uh, you're just stuck, you know, and we don't know what happened to all the other widows, but there was a lot of starvation going on uh, back then, uh, as there is today. There's some very poor people today, uh, and when we speak to God about a need, he speaks to us about a seed. Um, and so God had plans to perform a miracle of provision in her life, but it was her faith and her seed that activated the miracle. God wants to do miracles in our lives all the time, miracles of provision. We don't always uh, relate to, to them as being miracles because suddenly something happens and say, well, oh, isn't that wonderful? God just brought something into my life. We don't always equate it to the fact that weeks ago, months ago, possibly years ago, we've sown a seed over here and that we don't always relate the seed with the harvest um, or the harvest with the seed. That's why, as I say, with, with, with that system that Vanessa has put together, it's sort of like when something comes in, oh, here it is. And I can tell you exactly when I've sown the seed because we named the seed. Um, and um, so that's what was happening here, that it was actually her faith and her seed that activated the miracle. Please remember, God does not respond to need. There's needs all around us, needs everywhere on the face of the earth. If, if, if God responded to need, then Africa and all the starving children in, in various other parts of the world would be awash with groceries. It is not. God does not respond to need. God responds to faith. God is a faith God. God needs us to believe his word and to act on it in order to step into that which he has provided for us. So the small cake that she gave, compared to the tiny amount of groceries which she had left, which she had left was a big offering. You think about that. I thought about that and said, she was going to prepare one more meal. There's her and her son. Husbands evidently already died or left her, who knows what. Uh, um, and, uh, and there was enough flour for her to make to a... Make, uh, just one more meal. She was gathering sticks to put together a fire. One more meal, and then we're going to die. Then we have come to the end of the barrel, and there's nothing left. And the man of God says, you know, you make me some first. Don't fear, make me some first. So chances are that, uh, that her cake, her pancake, and the boy's pancake would have been smaller um, than, than, than what it would have been if she had been able to use everything up for just the two of them. So the man of God sort of moved in there and said, make me a cake first. This is God moving on this man to tell the woman to sow a seed. But I'm telling you, she sold a big offering. Um, and the word of the Lord, promising her ongoing supply of flour and oil, only came to pass after she sold the seed. God says, you must give me something to work with. You must give me something that I can multiply. In the Old Testament, God says, I will bless the work of your hand. If somebody folds their hand all day and doesn't work, God's got nothing to bless. And sometimes people do that. They give big offerings and then they just sit there and wait. God wants to bless the work of your hand. God is not limited to your job, to your business, but it could very well be one of the main uh, avenues of bringing blessing into your life, but God wants to go beyond that. You know, at a certain time, we can only work so, so many hours and so hard, and then when we're maxed out, then, you know, our faith, God is able, God's got a thousand and one ways of getting money to us, getting provision to us. So she believed and acted on the words which Elijah spoke. I've gone over this passage extensively, and I, th I just realized, I thought, in, in the next few verses that I'm about to read, there's four times it speaks about the words that were spoken. Twice it speaks about the word of the Lord, and twice it speaks about the words that Elijah spoke. She never heard the word of the Lord. She only heard the word that Elijah spoke. And you know, you and I, we have to have men of God, women of God that we can trust. So when they speak the word, see, a lot of Christians don't hear God for themselves uh, when it comes to, to, to some of these aspects of principles of prosperity and offering time and so forth. You've just got you to just know who to trust. And you also got to know whom not to trust. And, and I'm headed in that direction. And <laughs> praise God. We're going there. So she believed and acted on the words which Elijah spoke. Elijah said to her, for thus says the Lord God. So this is still the man speaking, but he's speaking the word of the Lord. So she might have said, I don't believe you. I don't believe you bringing the word of the Lord. Or, uh, or she did. She said, I believe. So the bin 
of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry. So imagine there's a barrel of flour. Each time she went into it with her cup to make her, her cakes or whatever, the, the more she it just never emptied out. There was a jar of oil each time she poured out, or for all I know, she might have put a cup in there as well. It just never ran dry. And the Bible says that she and he, she and he, the woman and the man of God and her son ate for many days. There was a drought on, uh, on the on the proclamation of Elijah himself. He says, it shall not rain in this country uh, except at my word. And by now, by now, there, there's like, uh, you know, a drought that's gone for a long time. And uh, Elijah was down by a brook that dried up. At that stage, the ravens were feeding him. They were bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. I suppose lunchtime he was fasting. Then all of that dried up, and the ravens stayed away. And God says uh, to Elijah, I want you to go up to Seraphat. There's a woman up there. I've commanded her to feed you. He goes up there, and uh, sure enough, he gets into the city, and he says to the woman, oh, bring me a little water. And as she ran off, he was like testing the waters. It's just, you know, sometimes uh, uh, prophets of God do that. They're like, oh, do this. And then when they do it, they say, oh, that's the one. And then he suddenly comes in and says, you know, in, in not so many words, you're the woman. God's commanded you to feed me. But she would have said, what? I haven't heard. And she hadn't. She hadn't heard God because she says, no man of God, I can't do that because I've only got a little flour left and I've got a little oil left and, and, and I'm just gathering sticks and then we're going to make a little cake. I'm going to eat it. My boy's going to eat it. Then we're going to die. We're against the wall. And he says, do not fear. He says, do as you've said, but bring me a cake first. And as I say, the cheek of it, if we interpret it from a natural level, but if we understand the principle of sowing and reaping, say, ah, of course, she has a need. And God speaks to her about a seed. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. That's in the, in the bold print there, verse 15. She went and did according to the word of Elijah. It doesn't say she did according to the word of the Lord. She did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, so there was an unlimited supply available. And when we're hooked up to God, and in God's economy, it's unlimited. God is not limited in any way. The Bible says that all things are possible to him who believes. Um, and so she hadn't heard the word of the Lord when he commanded her to provide for Elijah. And God says to Elijah, I have commanded, past tense, a woman up there to, to feed you. But she hadn't heard. So the man of God speaks to her. She hears the man of God. She steps out on his words, and she still receives a miracle. Now, there's a passage here in Second Chronicles that's a kind of a principle, good for us to understand. Chapter 20, verse 20. Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. So we are established when we believe God, but we are prospering when we are believing the prophets. Well, that's not specific to prophets. That's apostles, pastors, teachers of the word, but not just any old prophet. Notice it does not say believe every prophet. Because the problem is there's many wannabe prophets. Believe your prophet. And not prophets plural, but believe your prophet. It's gone very quiet in this house now. Do I need to retreat for a little while? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> See, the prosperity message has received such bad rap because there's too many wannabe prophets running around trying to muscle in on your seed. They're everywhere. They're on radio. They're on television. They come into, into our city, into our region, hold special meetings. Not all of them, but many of them are. They muscle in on your seat by getting you to sign up for their mailing list, sending you a few cute sayings you know, every now and then, and, and then they, muscle in, they want to muscle in on your seat. And many of them have got no feeling for God's sheep. They want to rip out the biggest offering out of you than what they can. In fact, a, a friend of mine... Uh, had a young man in this church that went to a particular conference that shall remain unnamed. If I name it, many of you would recognize it, know it. There was a young man, uh, and they had Mr. Offering Taker got up, and Mr. Superman Offering Taker uh, got up and just went for maximum, maximum, and 
You know, then there, there's certain phrases that are used, say, okay, uh, we're going to receive an offering. Listen to God, and the biggest number that, uh, that comes to your mind, that's God, and you give the, the biggest offering. And there was this young man there that had pledged, uh, 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 they'd given an offering and pledged a sizable offering. I'm talking in the tens of thousands. This guy's barely out of school. And my friend, the minister, got talking to this young guy, and the guy was almost suicidal. She said, I can't keep this up, but because out of the goodness of his heart, he tried to make the pledge good. And he's kind of starving himself so that he can make good his pledge. And I suggest to you that that was a demonic environment to rope this young guy into with no thought of how he was going to get on. And I'm saying, where was the pastor of this young boy? Where was the pastor who loves the sheep? who walks with, with the sheep, lives with the sheep, day after day, week after week. The pastor whom, whom this young boy knows, not, not Mr. Mr. Super Offering Taker that breezes into town and disappears again later on, nowhere to be seen, but you will still get his mail for years. You'll get his mail for years. You're still having fun? Something is wrong. Something has got seriously gone wrong. And then people have, they've given like the biggest offering that have gone, given way beyond their means. And then it hasn't worked out. And say, so, oh, that prosperity stuff, that just doesn't work. Oh, it absolutely works. You come to my house and I show you it works. But you need to know who your prophet is. And if you don't know who your prophet is, you're going to get fleeced, you're going to get ripped off. And there are many, many professional fundraisers uh, that are on today, you can hardly call them ministers, some of them might be, some of them are merchandising the gift. Uh, they say, we give you a prophecy, we give you the word of the Lord if you give us a big offering. You will notice that we preach the word here, whether you give an offering or not. Every Sunday there's fresh food on the table. We're not going to check people, your tithing record, everybody can come in. You know, oh, you didn't pay, you're not a part of our group. It doesn't happen. It may have in some churches, but not in this church. And if it takes you five years to get the revelation, if it takes you 15 years to get the revelation on tithing, you go at your own pace. I think I told the story. I was uh, watching Christian television, which I hardly ever do because I just get so, I just get so worked up. I thought, well, you, you, you charlatans, you, you crookery, crookery. This guy claiming to be a prophet and says, all right, everybody, here's the telephone number. Ring us up. Give us your credit card. We're about, we've got a special elite group of people. We're going to, there's a limited number of people. It's just limited spaces. The space is not limited here. We, we, we fill up the space. We just knock out another wall. There's, there's room for everybody. We don't limit like, oh, it's like creating a shortage mentality. And people fall for that. Like, oh, no, they're going to close, the, close the, the books and I'll miss out and, and, and the prophet's not going to give me a word. Oh. I got so upset. I click him off. You're not a prophet. You're a liar. You, you're, just, you're just a professional fundraiser. You're flashing a few pictures around of a couple of orphanages that you, you're supporting so-called and you're, you're consuming... 85% of the money that's given, you might be sending 15% of it. You're just a professional fundraiser. You're a crook. The tragedy is most people in the body of Christ and in terms of church members can't tell the difference between crooks and the right people. That's why everybody needs a pastor that loves people. And uh, I had this prophet muscle in on me one day, try me, tried to bring me into his little fold and uh, try to sort of exert a little bit of pressure on me and uh, and I had to just kind of let him know that, you know, <laughs> you, you may be a prophet, but, but you're not my prophet. You, you have no authority over me. I will honor you, but don't ask me to obey you and start to prophesy and prophesy me in and out just as, as, as you want. Some people will do that. They will absolutely do that. And young Christians are gullible, uh, and, and, and fall for that um, so easily. See, the, the, the problem of rogue ministers and professional fundraisers isn't you. It's not just something that's arisen with the age of television. Paul was dealing with that. <laughs> 2,000 years ago in the Corinthian church, he's had the same problem. But Paul goes up to Corinth, plants a church, stays with the people, lives with the people, teaches them the word. 
And then he moves on. And Judah come back again. And when he moved out, there was some people that came up from Jerusalem. Bible scholars refer to them as the Judaizers. They tried to bring people back under the law. Rather than to teach the glorious liberty in Christ, they tried to bring them back under the law. Said, you've got to keep the, uh, you know, all, the, all the commandments that Moses brought. And by the way, Paul's not the real apostle. We are the real apostles. And oh, Paul's not that good at public speaking. And, you know, we, we, we're just... You know, and, and so Paul dealt with that, and he heard the stories coming back, and then the Corinthian church was getting all funny and hoity-toity with Paul, So, oh, you know, you're just, you know, your appearance is not that flash and that. You know, I say, you know, we got humble pastors up and down this country that are bringing the word week after week after week. They're not the flashiest thing in town, not typically. Don't wear fancy wigs. Please notice, no wig. Their, their, their fingers are not diamond, diamond, gold and diamond studded and gold chains and stuff dripping off of them. Though, though I must say, I got a nice ring. <laughs> I got a very nice ring. And, and that one is gold and that one does have diamonds on it. Uh, but the one that I, that, I, that I bought when Vanessa and I got married cost me all of $12. All of $12. It was sterling sil silver. I thought I should be better than just a metal ring around my finger. So we bought a, a, a sterling silver ring and put it on my finger in fact the <laughs> yeah so this one is gold now it's a very nice but but you know if it wasn't for my wife insisting that you know marriage is important anyway we only paid about a, a quarter or a third for what, it, what it's worth it's just another blessing of the lord but uh you know with some of these guys there's just stuff dripping off of these guys wigs on fancy hairdos I'm embarrassing my kids now. One of the boys was saying that I got an island somewhere. I, what, what island? What island? <laughs> so Paul had similar problems. He planted the church. He lived with the people. He taught them the word. He was the first one in Corinth. And then when he moved out, there was these other guys coming in and speaking fancy words, and the Corinthian church fell for the fancy words of these other people. And here is Paul. He's the father of the work. He's the apostle. He is the pastor. And while he's away, he had to write this guy's letters and to reaffirm his credentials. It's almost like having to do self-defense stuff. I mean, how sad is that? Let me read you some of these passages. Are we still having fun this morning? Um <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. You know, you get these guys on television say, we are important. Well, they wouldn't say it in so many words. But man, we are really, we're doing stuff all around the world. We're very important. We're very good at promotion. Um, and making out that they're more important than the humble pastor who week after week feeds the sheep and these guys are coming in and trying to muscle in on your seat. I mean, there's something not right with that. We're not as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are, but they're only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as a standard of measurement. How ignorant. We will, we will not boast about things done outside our area of authority. So the story that I was telling you before of this prophet, he was a prophet, I have no doubt, but I wasn't part of his sphere of, uh, of uh, if you like, of, of spiritual authority. I didn't grow up under his ministry. I, I hadn't hardly received. I've been to a, to a meeting somewhere. I've given an offering, and then there's no further obligation on me. It's not right when a minister comes in, holds a meeting somewhere, ministers to the people once, and then promises them, you know, signs them up, and then expects offering again and again and again and again. I'm saying, what about the humble pastor? What about the humble pastors up and down our country that have to send their wives out working in secular fields because they, the pastors don't bring home enough money? There's not enough money in the local church. What's wrong with that picture? He says, we are not. Uh, we will only boast about what has happened within the boundaries of the work that God has given us, which includes our working with you. Verse 14, we are not reaching beyond these boundaries when we claim authority over you as if we had never visited you. We were the first to travel all the way to Corinth with the good news of Christ, nor do we boast and claim credit for the work someone else has done. Indeed, we hope 
that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work uh, among you will be extended. So Paul is like, it's like having to almost stoop so low as to reaffirm who he really was, that he was actually the father of the work in that particular uh, church, and uh, that they should not be falling for the fancy words of some of these guys that had uh, were great orators, great public speakers, um, fingers dripping with gold and with diamond, and uh, speaking fancy words for which the people of God fell, appealing to the people's lower nature, as it were, to, to their feelings rather than to what actually the word says. First Corinthians 4, um, verse 14, I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you have 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you only have one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ when I preached the good news to you. Now, the word pastor in the Greek speaks about uh, the word shepherd, and, and it indicates one who is a father-like one. Now, don't come and greet me later on and say, God bless you, Father. I don't want to hear that, okay? <laughs> I grew up in that place and had to say goodbye to the Father on the way out, but, uh, so don't call me Father. But a pastor is a father-like one. The one who cares for the sheep, who watches over them, lives with them, knows who the sheep are, knows where they're at. The sheep can come to his house, look around, check out how he treats his wife, check out his, his kids and just his whole lifestyle. Mr. a super offering, take it, flies in, you can't visit him. You don't know where he's to be, can't, can't be found. He's got a strong internet presence. And man, do they send out flashy magazines and, uh, and envelopes with it so you can yet send yet one other offering to them. But they've only been into the house, into the city once and preached one message and want to rip offering after offering, out of, after offering out of that city. There's something wrong with that picture. First, First Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9.1, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen? Jesus Christ is our Lord. Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet I am doubtless to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You are the proof, Paul says, that I am an apostle. I planted the work in Corinth. And why do I have to reaffirm my spiritual authority? Why do I have to reaffirm uh, that, that these guys that have come in, that speak fancy words and everything, why do you believe them? Um, what a tragedy. So Paul's competitors uh, had vied for the affection of the Corinthian believers. And this is not about whether somebody is an apostle or not an apostle or a prophet or not. This is about who is the shepherd in that particular field. And so they were vying for the affection of the um, Corinthian believers. They had st strayed into the sphere of Paul's gospel work and claimed credit for the work that he had done. And they received offerings from those who should have supported their spiritual father, Paul, and his missionary vision. And in fact, it, Paul says that he had not received any offerings for, for the Corinthian church, though he had a right to do so. I have not used that right. And in fact, in another situation, he says, I have robbed other churches so that I can come and minister to you. Now, of course, he hadn't robbed. He's basically saying that the Philippian church is about the only church that supports me financially, so I can go around and minister to you guys. You're not giving me any offerings, but then you get these orators coming in, and you just, oh, I'm these wonderful people. Imagine, uh, imagine there's two farms on either side of the Hutt Valley. One's up in the hills over there, and the other one's up in the hills behind Belmont. They're up on, what do they call it, regional park up there. There's a farm up there. You know, over there, this end is Farmer Brown, and up there is Farmer White. Let's keep it simple, brown and white. So Farmer White uh, is not satisfied with his uh, environment, so he goes over, he gra grabs a few blades of grass, uh, takes a spray can uh, of green, spray, shh, sprays over and says green grass. Then he goes over and he goes, here sheepy sheepy, and it reaches into, into Farmer Brown's uh, field. Here sheepy sheepy, uh, you know, strews some of that, a uh, few blades of grass around the sheep. Come, oh, that's, that's nice and green grass. It's not different to what they've got in their own, but, uh, but oh, that's wonderful. What revelation. Oh, Farmer White, you are wonderful. And then week after week, they make the journey down the fire breaks across the Hutt Valley up into Belmont to give their wool to Farmer White. How many of you know there's something wrong with that picture? Week after week, he's just giving them a few blades of grass, sprayed it so it looks a little bit greener. It's a wonderful revelation. It's no different than what the humble pastor is taught in the church. Week after week, what's the difference? 
Some of these guys are so fancy in the way that they can up-talk something. Just uh, uh, amazing. Ecclesiastes 12.9. Uh, we're winding down now. We're really winding down now. <laughs> Even though I feel like winding up. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 12.9. And moreover, the preacher was wise. He still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and said in order many proverbs. What's it like to prepare a message to preach? Just like that. Seeking out, pondering, finding words to bring spiritual truth, to bring a spiritual, spiritual food to, to God's sheep. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, verse 10, and what was written was upright words of truth. Verse 11, the words of the wise are like gold, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by 15 shepherds. Oh, given by 35 shepherds. Oh, at least by three shepherds. No? No, it says given by one shepherd. Do you know I found that the more pastors people have, the more confused they are. God wants us to have one shepherd, not 15. Who is the shepherd? The, ones that feed, the one that feeds the sheep week after week. One dishes up spiritual truth week after week. No flashy uh, presentations other than just loving the people and teaching truth week after week. Teaching them the principles on how to live for God, to commit their lives. In fact, that, that word there, the words of scholars are like well-driven nails. It speaks about golds. You know, they used to have prods back then to, to sort of with, with the cattle to prod them along a little bit. And, you know, sometimes pastors prod the people a little bit. Say, come on, you know, this is what the word says, to encourage and then to prod the people a little bit, but given by one shepherd. There's many scholars, many teachers. Paul says, though there may be a thousand instructors, he says, you only got one father. And who is the father? The father like one who is the pastor in the local church who lives with the sheep, cares for the sheep, and does the best he can to protect the sheep from being fleeced all the time because there's all of these, these, these wolves that want to move in in sheep's clothing. So God's ordained that each believer be planted in the local church and be under the spiritual authority of the leadership of that local church. And what that means, in, our, in, in Corinth, there was the Corinthian church, that's all there was. There wasn't the first church of Corinth and then the second church of Corinth and the Pentecostal church of Corinth. There was one church. Because nowadays you've got churches everywhere. But what that looks like is that when somebody moves from one church to the next church, then they got to transfer their religion, their loyalty from the pastor of the previous church to the next pastor. And that then becomes their spiritual father-like one. I've had people leave from here and go to, to another city or another environment, talk about the pastor there, and, and St. Miriam will say, look, pastor, I'm still praying for you like I always have and, uh, and you know, still support you. I says, listen. I appreciate you praying for me, but you really ought to be praying for your new pastor. He deserves that. You, you, go, you ought to give the best to him. I, I'm, I've got people that are praying for me, and I thank you for your prayers, but you need to now move on. And years ago, a lady sent us from another town, uh, sent us her, her tithe money, and, uh, and she wanted me to be her pastor and wanted me to, you know, uh, and found out that she's actually part of another church there, goes to another church, and I uh, sent the tithe back and says, listen, you, you, your tithe goes into your local church. It would not be right for me to receive your tithe. You get uh, televangelists that will absolutely not just want the offering now, they want your tithe as well. They want to muscle in on your seed. So there are many teachers, but there can, can only be one shepherd. The next point here, and, uh, and, and, and it says, wise sheep bring their wool to their own shepherd. It's, it's silly sheep that live in Farmer Brown's paddock, get chatted up by Farmer White over the hill, and bring the wool over there week after week. It's just silly. R wrong picture. See, if you've been pressured to give bigger offerings outside your local church than you give inside your local church, You've been fleeced. <laughs> it's very sad. I'm laughing, but it's very sad. People believe in God for their harvest. And somehow, you see, when sowing seed, the size of your harvest is not determined by the promises in fancy words of the wannabe prophets. Man, some of them are good with words. 
I've been with some of them. Yeah, they, they, you know, they just step up and without any preparation, but they, they got the gift of the gap. Just, I, I've been with them for, 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 for hours now. There's no prayer. There's no preparation. They just get up and they've just got this wonderful gift of the gap. So the size of the harvest is not determined by the promises and fancy words of the wannabe prophets. Each one of them needs to stay within their own sphere of influence and not muscle in on somebody else's sphere of influence. Get people on television harping on, that, oh, you need to send us money if you're going to go out of business. Well, don't buy the television station if you can't afford it. Stop whining and don't stop bleating to us. It's not our problem. Oh, I'm a prophet of God. Well, you might be, but you're not my prophet. We know who our company is. So the size of the harvest is determined by the size of your seed, by the operation of your faith, and by your wise choice of soil, namely your local church. We as a local church, I've been speaking generally about churches, pastors up and down the country. We as a local church don't make a big deal about special offerings. If you don't receive a lot of special offerings, when we get a guest speaker, we encourage you to give, and it's right to do so. But don't feel under obligation to give, to send more money on to the guest speaker. They've been here once, we've honored them, we've honored them well, and they're gone. We'll do that again tonight. We've got Pastor Margaret here. We will honor her with an offering, and when she's gone, she will demand no more because she's a, she's a, a, a proper woman of God. If somebody demands more and more and, and strays into somebody else's spiritual sphere of authority, Without the pastor knowing many times, I mean, if, if you're getting some of that stuff sent to you in the mail, and if you've made a pledge somebody, I, I release you from that pledge in Jesus' name. Be free. Be free. When we give a, receive a special offering, we don't use fancy words. We don't lose the sleekest presentations and everything. But I encourage you, so you better sit in the house. And we don't make a, a huge big deal. It's like, okay, you can all come and touch me now. And touch me, touch my shirt, feel the anointing, and feel the harvest, that, or whatever words that are used. No, we. No, you can touch me, you can give me a hug, but it's because we want to, you know, affirm that we love each other, but, you know, let's not get too fancy. Let's not get too fancy here. Hallelujah. Your local church, your pastor, is your prophet. Don't let others muscle in and claim spiritual authority over you that they do not have. Don't fall for that. And uh, last example, try going down to Countdown. Fill up your grocery basket with groceries and head out without trying to pay and when they t tackle you and wrestle you to the ground and call the police and you say, oh, I was going to go around to pack and save and pay my bill over there. <laughs> Why would we do the same thing in the body of Christ? We get fed spiritually and then you, others come in and the pack and saves of this world, the pack and save prophets and want to <laughs> you offering them, I mean, for goodness sake. Just a few sprayed on blades of grass that they sprinkle in front of you. It's no different to what gets taught in the house week after week, what's get taught in our special courses that we run, what gets taught in the Bible school. Praise God. Just lift up your hand right now. Just lift them up to the Lord. Father, we want to praise you. We want to thank you. Lord, I declare freedom and liberty over the people of God from pledges, from pressures that they've come under and will continue to come on as they go into other places and special this and special that and fancy word for this, that and the other to rip offerings uh, from them received by people that have no right to receive anything beyond to what, 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 uh, what is reasonable. And so, Father, we want to thank you that as we are faithful to the profit that you've put into our lives, faithful in our house, it might be flash or fancy, but, Lord, the seed just quietly grows and First the blade, then the ear, and then the grain in the ear. And we're going from strength to strength financially. We're prospering. People of God are rising up. 
people that haven't got a job are getting a job. Those that have a job are getting promotions. Those, Lord, that have businesses, there is a, an expanding out. There's greater profitability. Young people that are studying, Lord, passing with good marks. And, and Lord, you're leading them and guiding them by your spirit. The blessing of God is on all of our endeavors as we serve you and honor you in this house. And Lord, the funds that we send out of this house to feed hungry children, Lord, in other parts of the world and to help build church buildings and, and Lord, to help feed uh, uh, other people and every offering, Lord, that uh, we give in this house, the part of it is sent away. We're looking after the poor. We don't need to feel guilty. So I command for all guilt to be lifted off of God's people. I thank you, Father, for a spiritual understanding in these matters. In Jesus' name, amen.